This is CBC Here and Now. There are royalties right away, but it will be a while before big royalties kick in. Speeding drivers and fewer tickets. People think that, oh, I'm just going to get away with it. It's funny about Canadian awards, they always say it sort of guarantees that the show will be cancelled. After a long hiatus, a star-studded Christmas special, it's the return of hatching, matching and dispatching. Well, a beautiful sunrise for most of us this morning. Tomorrow morning, many of us wake up to winter, but it is a change to rain across the island. We'll break down your forecast coming up. Let's get to our top story. It's an important milestone. Today, Hebron celebrated first oil. There are now four oil producing projects in this province, but just because the oil is flowing doesn't mean those big royalties are. Here now as Peter Cowan explains. The announcement came over a high-tech hookup between the offshore oil platform and Hebron's onshore support centre. That as of 11.03 on November 27th, the Hebron platform successfully and safely achieved first oil. Wow. After years of planning and more than $14 billion, the Hebron platform is finally doing what it was built to do, pump oil. Today's celebration marked all the hard work done by thousands of workers, but the head of ExxonMobil today signaled there will be a lot more work to do to get to full production. This is just one of the 20 to 30 wells that will be in production. It will take us several years to, complete, to continue with the drilling operations till we reach 150,000 barrels a day. The oil is flowing, but don't count on big royalties to be flowing into government coffers anytime soon. First, Hebron has to pay off its costs. Well, it will certainly be a number of years before we get the larger, uh, the, the larger revenues in terms of the royalty, but there are royalties right away. The province expects to get just $10 million a year from Hebron. Hibernia, by comparison, pays out 60 times that in royalties. And the amount from Hebron isn't expected to go up for another 13 years. This project does also mean jobs. These are some of the 600 workers that Hebron will employ on and offshore. With the new benefits of an oil project also come the impacts. At a time when the province has vowed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Hebron will make the situation worse. Next year, the province will start making carbon emitters pay, but it still hasn't said how much. Um, they do have to be careful of what they implement to make sure that it doesn't usually impact uh, the offshore here in Newfoundland because we are competing with other similar offshore jurisdictions around the world. Even with carbon pricing, the province and the industry say they're focused on attracting more big oil projects to Newfoundland and Labrador. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Some good news for renters. Vacancy rates in St. John's may have taken a slight dip this year, but so have rent prices. That's according to the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. It says vacancy rates have leveled off after being on the rise for the last eight years. Property managers are lowering rent to compete for new tenants because fewer properties are being built. It found that luxury rentals, those that go for $1,500 a month and up, they've been pretty slow to rent. And while the new builds have the highest price tag, they also have the highest number of vacancies. The average rent for a two-bedroom apartment in St. John's this year came in at about $941, with the highest two-bedroom listed for $1,400. Prices vary based on how close the property is to the city's core. Questions are swirling tonight about why the MV Baby Leon, after being tied up for three years, was allowed to sail from Argentia on Saturday bound for Romania. The Panamanian registered cargo ship got 12 kilometers from shore before its engine quit. Tense moments ensued as the ship drifted too close for comfort to Cape St. Mary's. Two hired tugs eventually managed to get a tow line on board and escorted back to Argentia. But the drama began even before the baby Leon left port. Our Chris O'Neill Yates has been investigating. Chris, what happened? Well, Debbie, for those who aren't familiar with what happened, the baby Leon hit the Marine Atlantic dock while it was leaving port. Now, today we've learned the extent of that damage, and it isn't insignificant. Here are some of the pictures who sh that show how serious uh, the incident was. So this, we're looking at here at the, pile, uh, the piling for the, uh, for the wharf, that was broken. As well, we have a shot here. This is another one that's broken. And we saw earlier that the vessel hit the Marine Atlantic dock and left this 
shot. You can see the bulbous nose of the vessel here. It went right into the dock. So people are out there now. They've had divers in and they're investigating the damage. Uh, Marine Atlantic doesn't quite know yet, but the, the damage is quite significant. Now we've been able to, we've been trying to find out from Transport Cam Canada whether this vessel underwent an inspection before leaving port. A spokesperson told us that the vessel was cleared to leave by Panamanian authorities. That's where it's registered. And that it was cleared as well by an organization that monitors technical standards and certifies vessels. Transport Canada told us it carried out a port state controlled inspection on November 23rd and 24th, verifying that the vessel had all the statutory safety certificates in accordance with international requirements. They say no mechanical issues were observed or detected and the vessel is now restricted to the port of Argentia, pending the outcome of a new inspection which has emanated from this incident. So. That's where things are now. So Chris, back to the, uh, the dock incident. I mean, did the vessel just leave? Well, that's what we're trying to find out. We don't know. In situations like this, I'm told, if a vessel had a collision with a wharf, it would have to be inspected to make sure that there was no puncture, nothing that could compromise its seaworthiness when it went to sea. I have asked Transport Canada that, and I haven't heard back yet. I've also asked them if the vessel reported, which is required to do, that it had struck the Marine Atlantic dock before leaving port, and we still haven't been able to get an answer to that. As well, I contacted the ship's owner in Turkey and its local agent here in St. John's, and they both declined our request for an interview. All right, thank you. That's uh, Chris O'Neill Yates reporting live in our studio. More than 50 residents of Mud Lake are suing the provincial government and Nalcor for negligence. They filed a lawsuit that blames the Muskrat Falls project for a spring flood that damaged properties and forced people from their homes. Meanwhile, some residents who were displaced by that flooding are still in temporary arrangements. Here now is Jacob Barker joins us live with the story. Jacob, what are you hearing from people there? Well, Anthony, since that flood that happened six months ago when there was when the snow was just disappearing and the snow has now reappeared, uh, people have been living here at these suites on Five Wing Goose Bay Base. And ever since then, they've been living in limbo. We're no farther ahead now, a few maybe, than the day we started. Roland Saunders feels like he's starting out again. Starting, say, like, you know, a, a 19 or 20 year old just graduating college. So basically at 57 years old, I have to do that all over again. Saunders has been back and forth with the government over the damage assessment to his house and how much his compensation will be. I'm not very happy with the way things are going and uh, I probably won't be very happy with the uh, offer as well. He can't return to his house on Mud Lake Road in the lower part of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Apparently the, the building has been... Uh, deemed uh, uninhabitable due to uh, severe flooding and uh, structural damage. Saunders is part of the class action suit recently filed against the provincial government and Nalcor. It claims negligence, that they did not protect the people downstream. He's also asking for compensation for the stress and anxiety of knowing that a flood could happen again. The lawsuit contests the finding of the independent investigation by the government that found natural causes were to blame, not Nalcor's activities. Saunders clearly believes otherwise, and he's using his property to get that message across. I feel strongly that it's the government that's at fault here. Uh, no question in my mind about it, none, months ever, as you can see. Well, that lawsuit won't, uh, won't provide any immediate uh, solutions for the people that are living here. It could take up to a year just to get the class action certified. Reporting live for here and now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. A pretty serious story there, obviously, but it certainly looked quite pretty where Jake was reporting from tonight. It's pretty. Yeah. It's very wintry there. Not so much on the island, although I understand we have a few flakes coming down in our area. Yeah, that's right. A little bit of snow to dust off our cars when we leave uh, this evening. And uh, a webcam shot that I took uh, a couple of minutes ago uh, shows uh, what I think is either a salt truck or maybe a plow here uh, moving up Ken Mount Road earlier. Uh, that time is not correct. Uh, this was uh, maybe about uh, just before 6 o'clock. Minus 2 the temperature in St. 
St. John's still reporting some flurries at last check. Winds in from the north at 19 kilometers per hour. You can see where the bulk of the action here is now south of St. John's, but still likely seeing some flurries through Mount Pearl, the Goulds, uh, the north end, though, starting to clear off. And uh, back across to uh, Bay Roberts is uh, still seeing a few flurries here. Enough to, again, bring a little dusting. And as you saw with that webcam shot, looks like most of the snow accumulating on the sides of the roads, not so much where the traffic's been rolling through. Uh, flurries have tapered off along the west coast. It's Labrador City, where we have the flurries moving in right now, and that is on the leading edge of our next system. And watch your timeline here. By the time we get through the overnight hours tonight, those flurries push offshore from St. John's. It's a quiet start for the east and the northeast, but we will see some flurries moving into central parts of Newfoundland tomorrow morning, certainly western parts of the island, the northern peninsula, and back across Labrador, where those uh, snows will continue through the day tomorrow. It's a mixed rain across the island. We'll break down your full timeline with your complete forecast for the next three days coming up in a few minutes. Wednesday, CBC brings you a town hall on resettlement. Some say it's got to happen in a big way. Others say that would be tragic. Join us at the Smallwood Interpretation Centre in Gambo at 7.30 or watch live on CBCNL's Facebook page. The province is beefing up mental health care services on the Buren Peninsula. Here are now highlighted concerns about mental health services in Grand Bank last month. And we told you the story of two sisters whose husbands killed themselves in a span of just three months. Those deaths were among six suicides in the town in just over a year. Eastern Health announced today that starting tomorrow, there will be a drop-in service available for people who need mental health or addictions help. It will be available in Grand Bank on Wednesdays and in Marystown on Mondays and Tuesdays. Also, people can set up appointments if they need help any other day of the week. Well, Stephenville High is continuing its ban on sports. The administration stopped all team practices and tournaments following a sports hazing incident at the school. Police investigated but found no criminal activity had taken place. Now the school wants the RCMP to talk to students about the dangers of hazing and bullying before lifting the ban. That could take a week or more to be completed. Parents of Bishop Field students in St. John's are settling in for the long haul at the former school for the deaf. The elementary school has been closed since a section of the ceiling there collapsed in the gym about a month ago. The English school district had hoped to get the students back to Bishop Field by the end of the year, but that hope has faded. Here now is Carolyn Stokes reports. The school that many people in this area call the heart of the downtown community remains quiet and empty today. Parents had hoped that by now this school would be bustling with crews doing repairs, but that is a long way off. The assessment hasn't even been done yet and parents are wondering why. And we're just really starting to wonder, well, is this a priority for transportation works is this a priority for government right now because they seem to be kind of dragging their feet. School Council Chair Brad Stone says he's frustrated parents are in limbo waiting for government to give the green light for a full inspection of the school structure before repairs can begin. The Department of Transportation and Works has a proposal in hand and is reviewing it. Just extremely vague that they are considering it, uh, that there's no specific time for when they are going to do it, if they are going to do it. Um, yeah, and it's, it's just, it's not acceptable at this point. There should be people in there. The work should have been started if they were going to do it. Patience is wearing thin for parent Linda Nick Lawson. She's in the process of transferring her son to a different school that's closer to home. I'm not happy with it. It's not something that we wanted to do. He loves being with his friends. But the more time passes, the more convinced she is Bishop Field will never reopen. I don't think the government wants to put the money back into it. So now there's really no telling when or if these 300 students will see the inside of Bishop Field School again. The English school district says they'll stay here at the former school for the deaf for an undetermined period of time. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Now, still with this story, the Minister of Transportation and Works wasn't available for an interview, but the department says it plans to meet with the school board to discuss timelines and the scope of the assessment as soon as possible. Now to a story of hope, literally. The word hope is being lit up tonight at Rollins Cross in St. John's. It's part of what's being called Giving Tuesday, aptly named, coming on the heels of Cyber Monday's online shopping frenzy. Staff at Stella Circle, they're behind tonight's event and they hope to create their own frenzy, a kind of frenzy of joy. And that's where here now's jo joyful Jeremy Eaton joins us. Uh, Jeremy, what's happening now? 
Well, uh, they're just about to actually illuminate so the hope sign now. here. So uh, we're just going to wait for a little bit of a countdown and uh, we'll get to that real quick. Five, four, three, two, one. So uh, there you have it, uh, Anthony and Debbie. They've uh, just illuminated the word hope. And to figure out why they're doing it, we're joined by Denise Hillier, who is a director, uh, one of the directors here at Stella Circle. Denise, why are you lighting up the word hope? Well, lighting up hope uh, is a reminder to people that this can be a really difficult time of the year, uh, coming up Christmas, and it follows on the heels. It's Giving Tuesday, so it's a global day of giving. A reminder to people following Black Friday and Cyber Monday um, that you can give back to your community. And so we want to remind people at a difficult time of year that there is hope. Um, and that you have an opportunity to give back. I understand that this isn't the only hope sign. Are there other hope signs that we can see throughout the city? There are. We have uh, hope lit up at a number of our locations. We're located all in the downtown core. So, for example, Naomi Center, our Brian Martin Housing Resource Center, Emanuel House, and down on Cabot Street, we have signs lit up. How, many, how long has Stella Circle been doing, been lighting up hope? So this is the third year for us lighting up hope. Stella Circle works with over a thousand participants a year. So the opportunity for the public is to give to the programs and services uh, of Stella Circle, which fall under the pillars of real homes, real help, and real work. We uh, give people that opportunity to give by uh, looking at our website, stellacircle.ca, or they can text to 022 light up hope and uh, we do have a corporate uh, partner uh, blue drop who've actually agreed for the third year running as well to match the first twenty five hundred dollars worth of donations well please appreciate your time thank you so much you're welcome thank throw you. it back to you guys in the studio thank you jeremy uh jeremy eaton live in the downtown area yeah. of st john's it's a wonderful sentiment hope yeah. beautiful scene plus the snow gently falling it's yeah. nice and you know what they say it's always better to give than receive true Ah, there's one you won't get down your gullet, you dirty big booze bag. Mary Walsh and the all-star <laughs> cast of Hatching, Matching and Dispatching are getting together for Christmas, a Christmas fury. What could possibly go wrong?
there have been some big changes to the hunting regulations in this province. To learn a little bit more about it, I decided to suit up and join the man who pushed for that change. I'm Jeremy and I'll have that story coming up. Every time I turn around, Hunt's got a big bottle of whiskey or a bottle of rum stuck in somewhere poked underneath. Ah, there's one you won't get down your gullet, you dirty big booze bag. Listen to me, half sack uni ball, testy clops. Uh, Obi Wan Cajoni. Yes, we are having a big, fat, happy Christmas. So joy, X Noel, and hop the f off my land before I gotta get out the blunderbuss. And then, then that little pop gun you're wearing on your side won't do you much good. <laughs> kind of energetic welcome back to here and now if you're a fan of hatching matching and dispatching hard to believe that show was more than 10 years ago that was on cbc television you are in for a christmas treat mary walsh joins us on the set hello hey anthony how are you excellent up to your old uh, tricks i see i know i know oh. <laughs> so uh, a christmas special how'd this come about well you know um the hatching, matching, and dispatching was the favorite thing that I ever did. And it was wonderful working with all those people. It was just a, a very joyful event for me. And uh, then we fell between the cracks when, in regime change at the CBC. So I was devastated. And I, it's what I really always wanted to do, was to keep doing hatching, matching. So myself and my partner, Ed uh, McDonald, wrote a Christmas script to make a film. Maybe right. we could make a film. So all these years that we've been working, you know, some days, uh, you know, relentlessly, some days, you know, with our heads down on the ground, uh, depressed, some days full of joy, and we finally hit the right time. And there was a spark of interest after all that time that maybe they might do it. And indeed we did. We shot it in February and March in Newfoundland. The last one where I'm cursing at that policeman, uh, we were, it snowed all that day and we couldn't go in. So we were outside for 10 hours mm -hmm. because we couldn't go in because the snow would just melt like and we could go in for lunch change our clothes get dry right. but, so we were out like six hours in the afternoon but it was so good it was just so much what fun. was it like having that incredible cast reunited because i was looking at the people who were in it and i'm like these people in the 10 years since the show was originally on They've all done things with their lives and careers. Oh, my goodness, yes. Well, I mean, Mark McKinney and Sean Majumdar were already established, right? But people like Johnny Harris, I mean, does not stop working now. He has two series yeah. going. Uh, you know, Joel Thomas Hines just won the Governor General's. It had nothing to do with that. I, I like to think that it was hatching, matching. That, uh, that, <laughs> well, then he'd that, have to give you part of the prize. Yes, well, I, I think he is giving me part of the prize anyway. But, you know, and Sherry White down in L.A. working on 10 Days in the Valley as the showrunner. She's possibly the most popular showrunner in this country and in that people are constantly yeah. trying to get her. So Sherry said that she would never act again, that she likes being in the writing room and the showrunner, except to play Myrna in uh, in hatching well, nice. so um you know um it was magical to have everybody come back now, together. you mentioned regime change at the cbc and yes. i can't remember which sedan you're talking about yes we both worked for the company for a while uh, but the show had one season had critical acclaim i think you won pretty uh, prestigious writing awards we run the well. writing and i think i won an acting award too yep yeah, that year. But that's, it's, it's funny about Canadian awards. They always say it sort of guarantees that the show will be canceled. <laughs> Apparently so. Yeah. All right, so you managed to get the act together so you could do this. Don't want to give the whole show away, but what are we in store in this heartwarming Christmas reunion? Well, it's a reunion? Christmas story just like the Christmas story, just like all Christmas stories, I guess. In a sense, the first Christmas story was that the world was was sinking in sin and sorrow and that, uh, that God sent his only begotten son in order to redeem the world, right? And then in like, you know, Christmas Carol, Scrooge is living in misery in a, in a garret and... and uh, so this is in that vein? Well, this, it, the, the, the Furies are falling apart. Mamie Lou is leaving. Everything is up on bust. And uh, into their lives comes this awful child. Uh, not an awful child, but a child who's 10 years old, who's been in, uh, in foster care, in oh. not good foster care. And she sets fires to things and she, she's just very difficult. Let's call her difficult. Okay. And uh, she comes and she redeems the Furious Christmas. All right. Yeah. So, so there is only one Christmas story, really, when you think about it. True. So it's a bit sad, a bit funny, a bit serious. It's got everything. It's very, very funny. Mm -hmm. And but but it. Um, I, I don't think that it's. You can say it's sad. It's very funny and very heartwarming. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Look forward to seeing it. Uh, thanks a lot for coming in. Thank you.
Now, of course, you can't really do a Christmas story set in Newfoundland without at least taking a look at one old tradition. Mark, what's the noise out by the porch door? <laughs> Granny, tis mummers, there's yeah. twenty or more. Yeah. Her old withered face brightens up yeah. with a grin. Yeah. Any mummers, nice mummers, love Any mummers, love me? <laughs> Why are you trying to ruin Christmas? <clears throat> you two bloods of bitches. Are you ever going to get a dust of scent? <clears throat> Darlene, get off, no. girl. It's not us, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's not us, <a> more. <laughs> I can't wait to see that. Yeah. I loved the series when it was on television. Yeah. It was skating right on the border all the time. That's and quite the so border. And so special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no doubt it will uh, push humor and the limits of all that. So Christmas Fury this Sunday, December 3rd at 8 p.m. in most of Labrador, 8.30 island time. I'm not going to get caught if there's nobody there. One driver demands change following a dramatic drop in police ticketing on our highways. Welcome back to Here and Now. Last night, Terry Roberts brought you an exclusive story that showed the number of speeding tickets handed out by the RCMP this summer and showed that they plummeted compared to last year. 
Mounties were redeployed in significant number to Labrador to protect Muskrat Falls equipment. It happened to coincide with a lethal highway accident death toll. 18 people perished in a seven-week period between August and September. Now, earlier, I met up with Pauline Quinlan, a petition organizer who survived a serious accident on Veterans Memorial Highway. So, Pauline, you've seen the numbers that show that the police weren't handing out as many tickets. What do you make of this? Very disheartened. Mm -hmm. um, to say I'm surprised is, is not a shock at all. Um, I drive it every day. I never see anybody. With the exception, of course, ironically, this morning there was one pulled over on the highway. Um, everybody drives too fast. I drive between 100 and 110 on the highway. Everybody goes past me. Like very seldom do I ever get the opportunity to pass anybody on the highway. Yeah. And to me, that's very disturbing. It, it says that there's something wrong. Now you sent us some of your dash cam video. Maybe you can give me a sense of what, what do you see day in, day out as you come to work for the Bay Roberts area? Excessive speeding. Right? Excessive. Um, veterans is everything from excessive to um, slow drivers, um, impatient drivers. Trans Canada, 120, 130, 140 seems to be the going speed. And me at 100, it's like I'm not even moving. How often do you, from your experience, how often do you actually see a cruiser out there on patrol trying to send a message to motorists? Maybe once a week during the times that I travel, which is from 7 in the morning till um, 8 in the morning, and then again 5 until 6 p.m. in the afternoons, and very seldom do I see one. Is it your sense that that's enough? Not even close, not even close. And, you know, I mean no disrespect whatsoever to the RCMP. They do a great job with, with what they're given. It goes back to the federal government to make sure the funding is there to put officers in place just for strictly patrolmen. Um, you know, there's crime rate is so high. You turn on the news every day, all you hear is an armed robbery, robbery here. Murders are through the roof. People are obviously busy working on those things, and there's just not enough people to go around. And yet, you sort of take a look at what happened. It appears that some of these RCMP were sent up to Labrador for this Muskrat Falls situation that existed. What do you think the effect is when you don't have police handing out tickets as much as they used to? It's, it's a huge impact. You know, people think that, oh, I'm just going to get away with it. You know, I'm willing to bet if I got up in the morning and I said, you know what, I'm going to do 140 on my way to town today. I do 140 no problem because chances are I'm not going to get caught if there's nobody there. And it needs, and I know people, they say you can't fix stupid, and I hate to use that word, but you know what, in this case, if the shoe fits, wear it. People have to be accountable for their actions. They have to understand that the rules are put in place. If you have a, a thousand pound moose come up on the highway and you're doing 140, good riddance to you. You're toast. Last question for you. I know my own reaction. I think most of us, when we're driving, no matter how fast we're going, when you see the police car there, the first thing you do is look down to see what you're doing, right? Yeah. So the effect of actually having more tickets might actually get people to say, whether, whether they're good drivers or not, they can say, okay, we got to slow down. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, if people know that they're going to be there, I'm not saying every day, but two or three times a week, if they know that those areas are patrolled, chances are they're going to be a little bit more hesitant when they're driving on the highway. They're going to make sure that they're doing their speed. They're going to make sure that their cell phone is not in their hands. I see everything from people putting on makeup, people eating breakfast, while I'm driving to work and it's just it's very distracting and it's not it's not necessary. Right, Pauline, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, here's a shot sent to us courtesy of Ian Kirby, our beautiful church with the fresh snowfall in Mud Lake. That is gorgeous. One of the more beautiful pictures you've seen out of Mud Lake. Uh, yeah. That is really nice. Look how pristine and white it is. It's gorgeous. Mm, thanks. Nice one. Very nice. Uh, and again, uh, thanks to everybody who's been posting pictures to my Facebook page. Uh, yeah, snow in Mud Lake, snow in Western Labrador, and that is uh, on the leading edge of the next system, which will bring a little bit of snow into the mix for Newfoundland tomorrow. West mainly, chance of seeing a little bit of accumulation uh, in central parts of Newfoundland as well. Here is the live look at the webcam right now in Wabush, and you can see where, uh, I shouldn't say it live look, the live conditions. Uh, minus 11. Uh, I took that webcam snap uh, about an hour ago as uh, before the sun uh, set and it really got dark and you can see where the plows are out on the roads there and that is again on the leading edge of our next system which is rolling in along the warm front. You can see where we've got a little bit of snow. I picked up by the radar in the gas bay rolling across the Maritimes and that moves in through the overnight hours tonight. Here's how it all plays out. Watch your timeline. Those flurry chances ending in the St. John's and Northeast uh, as we roll through the, throughout the overnight. That snow builds in Happy Valley Goose Bay up towards the North Coast. 
By 6 a.m., likely some snow underway for Cornerbrook, even stretching into the Humber Valley region, the Northern Peninsula. Chance of seeing some flurries as far inland as Grand Falls, Windsor, certainly Port Abasca. Note those temperatures, which will be rising uh, through the early morning hours. And so our overnight lows will be closer to the midnight hour along the west coast. And we are going to be seeing winds moving in from the southwest and a little on the gusty side to near 70 kilometers per hour by morning. It's a quiet start for St. John's, the Avalon in the northeast, and we will see that snow mixed to rain for the west coast, central parts of Newfoundland after the, again a little bit of snowfall, and we are looking at uh, by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Most of that snow starting to push offshore already. If not by 5, then certainly by mid evening. You can see where we're looking at close totals close to five centimeters for most of southern parts of Labrador, perhaps a few pockets here closer to 10 and the possibility of some five to 10 centimeter accumulations over the long range mountains. But generally it's a trace to as much as a centimeter or two central back towards the Cornerbrook region. Better chance of again picking up a little bit, but it's all wiped out by that rain that's coming in behind. Temperatures rise to about six degrees for the Avalon Peninsula. The rain does not arrive until tomorrow evening as uh, that system will really take its time moving from west to east across Labrador. You can see where temperatures will get up to the freezing mark and just above in the Straits with a bit of mixing there. But uh, Mary's Harbor and North, this is going to be an all snow event. Now an interesting setup coming here with this cold front coming through Thursday morning. We start with the southerly wind winds shift to no uh, west and then north and could see the potential certainly here for uh, a couple of centimeters of snowfall around the lunchtime hour into the early afternoon hours. Again, pretty complex setup here. Uh, lots going on, but I'm keeping an eye on that for the possibility of some snow for your drive home on Thursday uh, across uh, St. John's in the Avalon region. Winds really gusty in from behind uh, 70 kilometers per hour. Everybody else is clearing from west to east through Thursday, so those temperatures will be dropping uh, for the southeast. Minus 9, Happy Valley, uh, Labrador City, minus 4 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. And again, some onshore flurries continuing along parts of the west coast. And a look into Friday, uh, kind of a, a quieter day chance of a flurry up towards the southeast uh, uh, parts of Labrador looking at you know the Straits uh, maybe a flurry late day Nain as well Labrador City but generally kind of a quieter day temperatures just above the freezing mark uh, not so quiet as we roll through to towards the weekend into the weekend and into next week we'll talk about that coming up in a few minutes up next part two of our special feature that takes an in-depth look at the question of resettlement
hands up if you favor resettlement? Ask that question in Galtus and you might be surprised by the reaction. Tonight, part two of Terry Roberts' special feature on Galtus, a struggling island community on the province's south coast. But there is one woman who's hoping to save the town from extinction. It's Wednesday evening in Galtus, the most lively night of the week. The women are in a party mood sharing laughs over libations, sharpening their aim, looking for the big score. About 20% of the town's population gathered right here at these tables. It's something they look forward to each week. That's the only thing that is here for as long as they'll play dirts. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only thing we got, everybody get together, a few darts, yeah. you know, game darts, enjoy yourself. Beyond the darts and the music and the drinks though, thoughts about the future are never far away. So when the music fades, so too does the mood. Is Galtus a dying town? Yes, it is. Why do you say that? Because it is. Resettlement. It's not talked about formally here anymore. But ask for a show of hands and it's clear. Many here want to leave. You know, maybe there's an offer that government could make to you. Would you take such an offer and maybe move? Yeah, I wouldn't take second thoughts. Yeah. I wouldn't. Previous resettlement votes proved a large majority want out. Away from the uncertain ferry connection to Hermitage. Away from the economic hardship brought on following the closure of the fish plant. More than 80% have voted to resettle in the past. Not enough to meet the 90% threshold to trigger government resettlement money. So it's happening naturally. Since these images were recorded in 1990, the population of Galtus has shrunk by 80 percent. There are a lot of nice people in the area itself, and we love there. So where have all the people gone? To places like this, Seal Cove, just across the bay from Galtus. People like Sheldon Nash, his girlfriend Olivia McDonald, and her nine-year-old son, Drake. It wasn't easy leaving Galtus, but pretty much I had to do what's best for my family. Yeah. Better supports for Drake, yeah. easier access to services, better job opportunities. That's what forced them away from Galtus. I don't think really there's going to be much of a future there because eventually people's going to have to leave from the ferry issue, breaking down, not running half times because of the wind. Sheldon voted in favor of resettlement multiple times. He says the money would have made the transition much easier. 250, 270,000 in your pocket, it, it would mean a lot. Because then, they saw me in now, I could have had it bought and paid for. Now they're doing it on their own, out of necessity. I think my future here is going to be really good. Hard to find someone with a positive outlook for Galtus. Not even the men with gainful employment in the aquaculture industry. I'll let you, I'll let you come back, yeah. But it's too late for it now, I think. Cause... It's too late. And it's not just Galtus. There are seven small communities on the south coast linked by ferry, a service that cost the province nearly 10 million last year. Just over 700 residents in all. Here in McCallum, about 50 people, just four school aged children. Galtus is one of the lucky ones. Three, sometimes more visits daily by the ferry, averaging less than three passengers per crossing. But change is coming on that front. Government is exploring ways to provide the service on a more cost-effective and efficient manner. A reduction in ferry services could speed the exodus from places like Galtus. But despite the odds, there is someone fighting to save this place. So, Gord, this is a great idea. Here she is with Galtus Mayor Gordon Hunt. Her name, Jane Pitfield. Roots in Ontario and Quebec. Businesswoman politician. She visited Galtus a decade ago and fell in love with the place. Galtus has a beauty that is unique. It is a jewel. She's helped market Galtus as a tourist destination. Now she's eyeing another idea, converting the dormant fish plant into a greenhouse for growing vegetables. My hope for Galtus is that we can find a way that it can be self-sustaining. She brought in organic gardening experts from Quebec. They went inside and liked what they saw. They could basically grow uh, most all of their greens needed for the area, so there should be no problems with that. Three, maybe five jobs, 
Pitfield says she'll lobby for government money to get it going. Back at the Lions Club, they're not thinking about fresh vegetables. I'm gone, so it's like it's a phone call. <laughs> Definitely this time. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Galtus. Still with the issue of resettlement, CBC is holding a town hall on resettlement tomorrow night in Gambo at the Smallwood Interpretation Centre, and it's going to be broadcast live on Facebook. CBC's Ramona Deering is hosting this event. So Ramona, what are some of the issues you're going to be looking at? Well, Debbie, I want to share ideas from three people with you right now, and one of them is Grenfell Campus's Kelly Vaughden. She's an expert on rural communities. She hates the idea of willy-nilly resettlement. Hmm. She says you, it's, you can't take it back once it's done, right? So one of the ideas she has is maybe you could look at reduced services if communities want that, if people want to stay. So how do we continue to provide essential services, but potentially in other ways? I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, to be naive and suggest that, uh, that the cost of services aren't an issue in rural areas. But I think uh, rather than, again, looking at this black or white, either resettle, move everyone, uh, which is an irreversible kind of decision, at least uh, have the conversation about service alternatives. Vaden says things like telehealth, distance education, even homeschooling, and looking at reconfiguring ferry schedules could help. So Ramona, that is one idea. What's the next one? Well, let's hear it from Rob Greenwood. He's the executive director of the Harris Center at Memorial University. In many communities where there are older people who are either retired or close to retirement, and they own their home, and if they're in, within driving distance of an urban center where more services are available, I think it's silly to even talk about resettlement. Um, if it's a more remote location, people do have to make decisions. But Greenwood says people need a lot more information before they can make those kinds of decisions. They need to know, Debbie, things like where will the nearest x-ray machine be? Where will the nearest specialist be? And Greenwood says that people really need to hear a plan from the government, that it needs to get on the hop with this and quickly, because people need to decide will they stay or will they go. But you know, I'm not hearing a whole lot of people pushing for resettlement. And you will not hear that from Peter Fenwick. He is the mayor of Cape St. George. And he says that the government's resettlement program has a lot of issues, but he is a staunch defender of rural Newfoundland and Labrador. But as far as that resettlement program goes, he says it has serious, serious flaws. Families could get up to $270,000 in financial assistance once a community goes ahead with resettlement. Why would you tell people we will give you $275,000 if 90% of you are willing to leave for your house <clears throat> when in fact what happens is people decide that well we we have opportunities elsewhere and we would probably like to move there but our house is worth maybe ten or twenty thousand dollars as a summer cottage and so instead of selling it and then moving uh, they sit there and wait and they wait for the 275,000 and the big bonus in the package is as it's called and that means that the policy is, is basically flawed. It's it is doing exactly the opposite of what it's supposed to. So Ramona, that's probably going to give you something to talk about tomorrow night. I think so. There is so much to discuss. Everyone is welcome to our town hall in Gambo. It's at the Smallwood Interpretation Center at 7.30. And for those who can't make it, you can still have your say. We will be broadcasting live on CBC's Facebook page, CBC Newfoundland and Labrador Facebook page. I certainly look forward to it. Yeah, thank you, Debbie. <laughs> What a week for Come From Away. The Broadway show broke a box office record and scored a Grammy nomination for Best Musical Theatre Album. It's raked in more than $1.52 million, the highest for any eight-week show playing in the New York Theatre. And that's not all. A company also plans to turn the show into a feature film.
Welcome back. Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Livy Allen of St. John's. She's 14 years old, has been sailing for four years. Livy sails with the Royal Newfoundland Yacht Club and is on the Newfoundland and Labrador race team. Yeah, and Livy received two awards from the Yacht Club earlier this month, Junior Sailor of the Year and the Provincial Optimist Champion Award. <laughs> Congratulations, you're today's young athlete of the day. Nice. So I'm pretty happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what today is? It's a Tuesday. Yeah. Toke Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. Two yeah. Toke Tuesday. That's right. So <laughs> one Toke on Twitter, one Toke on Facebook because... Uh, I had an uncle who wore it like this. I think yeah. it does a lot. Don't you think? <laughs> so it's time uh, to ask a question of you and you can give us the answer. Right. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, the much coveted Toke. And we're going to ask... A qu I've got some family that's going to be visiting Newfoundland for the first time. Yeah. All right. We'll get to that in a bit. There was somebody who won last week, though, right? Uh huh. Oh, did we not announce the winners? We did, but we have a picture of her. Oh, okay. See? And she oh, wears it. She, she is, wears right. it much better. Adele than I do. Earl from nice. Gander. And she's happy. And so you can have one of those toques. So it uh, looks pretty cool. Yeah. And the question we sort of I hashed out. I have it. Okay. It's you. All Good. about you. Anthony has visitors coming to Newfoundland for Christmas next month. Your job is to convince him on my Facebook page or his Twitter handle, uh, why his guests should visit your community. Do that and you might just walk away with a toque. So tweet at that Anthony Germain or uh, my Facebook page, already getting some great suggestions. You should okay. bring your family to the Goulds because Goulds rules. Rules, of course. <laughs> Anyhow, you can Hard to argue these. with that. Yours will come in a plastic bag, it won't be this one. So there you go. Oh, yeah, that's right. Brand new. Send yes. in your suggestions. <laughs> your toques that we send out are new, not from Anthony's head. That is important to establish. Uh, okay, <laughs> weather forecast time. Uh, let's have a look at our system that's moving in right now. And again, great toot weather over the next day or so as this system tracks in with some snow uh, rolling into Labrador City as we speak. Central, eastern New uh, Labrador, and then across to western parts of Newfoundland by tomorrow morning. Here's how it all plays out. We've got the snow by the time we get to tomorrow morning into Happy Valley Goose Bay, Corner Brook, some flurries into central parts of Newfoundland as well. It's a mixed terrain across most of the island tomorrow. Uh, basically, the Long Range Mountains will be the only place that uh, I think stay wet, slushy snow over those higher elevations. Uh, again, for eastern Newfoundland, it's a pretty much dry day with the rain arriving into the evening. Now, by Thursday morning, we wake up to rain here on, along the Avalon. But as the winds shift to northerly and we see temperatures drop, the potential in the back side of this low to pick up a couple of centimeters of snow. It's an interesting setup, but one that we're going to have to keep an eye on over the next 24 hours or so. Not a guarantee, but certainly the possibility is there. So we'll keep an eye on that for your Thursday here in the east. Rest of the province, it's clear out day on Thursday. A few lingering flurries along the west coast and some snow building back in, uh, but light into Labrador. Just some flurries on the menu for Friday, whereas Newfoundland is looking pretty good on Friday under a mix of sun and cloud and temperatures rising back to and just above the freezing mark. So Friday certainly the pick of the next three days across a good portion of the island, whereas Thursday is the, pretty ni uh, the nicest one across Labrador. Now this area of high pressure, Bringing us the sun on Friday, it is going to be a key player as we roll into the weekend time period. And forecast models, boy, they're just basically throwing paint on the wall at this point, and every run is a different uh, color. Uh, that is how much shuffling we're seeing with the ideas for this weekend. But here's what the basic setup is. This area of high pressure is going to hang on as long as it can, uh, and this low is going to build off to our south and east. The latest thinking is that certainly cloudy on the island on Saturday and then I think those precip chances really start to ramp up through Sunday as that low gets closer and closer and this with that northeast flow it's a moist uh, setup and so I think we're looking at rain drizzle and fog setting up as we roll into the Sunday, Monday into Tuesday time period. Or really, uh, I think we could see some flurries mixing in in central parts of Newfoundland with a bit of a wet, uh, again, cool setup there, especially in this, uh, uh, the later parts of Sunday. So we'll keep an eye on this setup, but it's not looking like a very uh, Christmassy setup into early next week. And for Labrador, you can see where uh, temps ride in that uh, certainly minus 8 to minus 9 range over at least the next four or five days.
So have you guys got your tree yet? No, I have A little too early. Yeah, a little too early I've for seen me. them out. Yeah, I have too, but I try to leave it as close as I can. It's got to be December 1st, right? Yeah, I think mm. you'd have to have the miracle grow to keep it yeah. going. Check out this keener. <laughs> This, this is something. It attracted some unwanted attention. It looks like uh, scenes straight out of a movie like Christmas Vacation or Whoville. This happened, though, in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Yeah, and it sort of looks as though this uh, thing that belongs in a mall or the beginning, the entrance of a church is massive. Yeah, the uh, police snapped the photo of this small but mighty car and shared it on Facebook. The lengths that people will go through to get a tree at the holidays. The perfect uh, tree. Yeah. Imagine when he gets it home and his missus doesn't like it. <laughs> That's it yeah. Take it back. Yeah. It's too big. Take it back, yeah. It's too green. Oh, what a what a story though. Uh, That's what. Well, go ahead. Say goodnight, Ryan. Yeah, I guess we'll say goodnight. <laughs> better better left unsaid. See you all tomorrow. Have Stay a great in night. <laughs> Good night. Good luck with the tree. Good call.